What's up, peers, and welcome to the World Crypto Network. You're back at the Understanding Bitcoin Conference in Malta, and we're joined by one of my favorite ethical open source entrepreneurs, Francis Pouliat from Bull Bitcoin. How are you doing, my friend? Oh, I'm doing fantastic. Thanks for asking. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, definitely, we have here a lot of fun at the conference. Uh, how do you like it so far? How, how are the people, how are the conference, the demos, and all that? Uh, it was great. I think the, the level of expertise was one of the highest that I've seen at, at a Bitcoin conference um, probably ever. Um, it's, it felt a lot like the breaking Bitcoin conference, but building on Bitcoin conference and uh, huddle huddle conference, um, which is uh, very technical, um, but at the same time with uh, the idea of trying to explain it to the, to the average person. And also definitely a, a cypherpunk vibe to it. A lot of the projects were cypherpunk projects. Um, so overall, it was great. It was also a great uh, opportunity for some of the Bitcoin builders um, to, in, in between the time we were explaining to the public what we're doing, we were actually working behind the scenes, uh, collaborating and building on stuff. Um, what was also really good was uh, the feedback being given to some of the open source project developers. Because, you know, sometimes when you're developing an open source project, um, you know, you're kind of working out of your basement late at night, uh, days on end. And uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, the people who are putting issues on GitHub, for example, might not be the average user. Um, so it was really a great eye opener for, for me and for a lot of people to um, talk face to face to, to people that are beginning and that are actually trying a very hard, that are very willing and that are facing some obstacles. And my concept is, you know, if someone is, is really truly willing to do something and can't technically, uh, we have a problem, right? So uh, it's not for lack of motivation, it's just for lack of uh, available tools. So I think uh, uh, we, we, we developers and we, we open source project developers got a lot of uh, good feedback that uh, we're gonna be uh, putting into implementation uh, as soon as we all get back home. Um, exactly right. The the feedback that's critical, right? And especially how users or the problems that users have, right? And and where they where they perceive that the problems are that Bitcoin can solve, mm -hmm. right? Because oftentimes, especially in a blockchain space, they know what the fuck the problem is, right? Mm -hmm. And then you start on the complete wrong path, and you will never end up at any any some reasonable place. Mm -hmm. uh, but actually, then really being like feet on the ground, and of course, you've done that at the Bitcoin Embassy uh, uh, quite a lot, right? Really talking to to all the users and seeing where they have the problems, and then as an entrepreneur trying to solve them, yeah. right? Um, so so yeah, I mean now like. Maybe just a little bit for for uh, the demo that you gave, right? Mm -hmm. CypherNode, yeah. awesome damn project, and uh, now version 2.0. So first of all, congratulations! Um, as a, you, you, so you you introduced the project at the Baltic Honey Badger Conference. Now at Understanding Bitcoin 2.0, what has changed? Oh yeah, okay. So um, right now on the project, uh, you're gonna find the uh, release candidate, uh, the second release candidate. So we have the same philosophy as Bitcoin Core. So before we do a, a major release, which we expect people to download and run in their in their businesses, we put out a few release candidates and do some bug fixing. There's a lot, a lot of changes. So the first thing I'm gonna say is to get the full list of changes, simply go on the releases tab in the CypherNode GitHub. They are all listed there. There's a few. Um, mostly, I would say that the two big things that we did was uh, we really bootstrapped well and uh, did a robust job on our Lightning Network um, features. Um, that includes um, a few custom features that we built on top of C Lightning in the same uh, philosophy as the C Lightning plugin system. Um, we have a, a web, uh, uh, you know, a REST API for web developers in order to create lightning invoices and receive callback notifications when the payment is received. Um, and that is extremely fast. So um, the, the callback system from CypherNode to um, the client application is as fast as the lightning payment itself. Um, so, you know, if, if you're, if you're using a CypherNode um, uh, uh, API to create an invoice and you're paying it um, by the time that the uh, paid animation on my Claire wallet is done, CypherNode has already called back the application. And so it's like, it's instant. It's actually instant. It's, it's mind blowing. It's really fast. Um, we also did a lot of work on uh, some functions to be able to programmatically send out lightning micropayments to users. So that's kind of what's lacking right now in the ecosystem is, is an ability to programmatically do payouts. So a lot of the tools have been uh, built for merchants to accept payments, not so much for like exchange withdrawals in Lightning. Um, so we, we started to build some functions in order to have a streamlined communications flow between a payout entity and a receiving a user. Um, for example, uh, um, 
if a payment is, uh, is pending, you know, we don't stop, we continue doing it. Um, we have some sanity checks uh, to decode both 11 invoices. Um, we have a, a function called, uh, just a simple function called the connect fund, which will connect and fund the channel instead of doing two API calls. Um, so building a little bit of abstraction there. Um, the second big feature that we built is what we call the, the XPUB watcher. Um, and that's a feature which is, uh, which is very useful and uh, which didn't really exist uh, as a self-hosted option. Um, and there was very, very few services that, that, um, that uh, uh, you know, that had this feature as a, as a, as a hosted option. Um, so what it is, is, you know, in the Bitcoin system, you have a, an HD public key. And then uh, that's kind of like in the back end of your wallet. You can usually see it somewhere, but it's, it's somewhere like in, in the settings. And your, your wallet is going to be deriving new addresses, new fetch addresses from that key. Um, however, uh, imagine that you want to uh, uh, watch uh, uh, the XPUB key itself um, automatically and not have to derive them and watch them individually each time, which is very useful. Um, so what we do is we have a system that will derive 100 addresses from a master public key and it's going to be watching them. Uh, that, what that means is, is there's like a little software that's going to be looking for new blocks and um, uh, looking for payments that are sent to these addresses. And every time a payment is found uh, by, the, by the watcher, well, first of all, it's going to notify automatically um, well, whichever callback you have that you receive the payment. Um, but also it's going gonna, it's gonna to check to see in the derivation path of the XPUB um, which is the order of the key that received the payment. And it's going to make sure that there's a hundred more addresses after that, that it's watching. Um, so it's a, like a kind of a gap limit in the watcher. So for example, let's say that you derive a hundred addresses and you know, the first 22 addresses are not paid. The 23rd address is paid. We're going to derive another hundred uh, addresses. So we're going to be watching 123 addresses and we also watch the addresses retroactively. So that's, that's really, uh, really useful for a lot of things. Um, it's, we build this feature specifically to be able to um, integrate bills into a BTC pay server without having an API between the two. But this is also something that um, eventually could be connected to, um, for example, uh, mining pool payout systems or something like Tallycoin or stuff like that. Um, that's, that's been really uh, neat and, and cool to develop. Um, we also I I integrated um, the Spark uh, wallet in CypherNode, self-hosted. So that means that when you're launching your CypherNode instant, instance, uh, wh what I realized you know, with the, um, the Torch, uh, Lightning Torch uh, uh, thing was that it is kind of difficult to, to, to manage the channels and the, the Spark uh, wallet the user interface has a channel management utility. So instead of building our own, we just integrated that in there. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, that, that, that's pretty neat. Um, another thing that we introduced was the concept of Cypher apps. So CypherNode was built as a straight like Bitcoin server. Um, however, real, we realized that using the Docker technology that we're using, normally what, what you do when you're building an application is that you'll have an API and then you have your own software, which is running in a completely different environment. And your software is making calls to an external API and it's sending you back. Um, instead of doing that, what we do is we launch the backend, the CypherNode backend in the same Docker environment as the app itself, right? So we're bundling the, the Bitcoin backend and the, it, it's a framework to bundle your app as part of a Bitcoin backend so that your app is not connecting to your Bitcoin backend over the internet. It's actually connecting over a private uh, encrypted Docker network directly. So there's nobody that can see the communication between your app and your Bitcoin backend, which is much more secure. Um, and if you're using Docker and you're using a Dockerized app, you'll be absolutely mind blown at how easy it is um, to integrate that. Um, a few more features on top of my head. Uh, I can't really remember them. We added some documentation for, for developers to integrate. Um, and we started to do some, uh, some infrastructure work um, to make it more scalable and modular so that in the next releases, instead of like um, going a, a little feature by feature, we can really add a lot of new stuff in a really streamlined way in the future releases. So, you know, it's, it was kind of an infrastructure change, a little bit of feature changes, but really setting up the roadmap for, for the new upcoming changes that are going to be in uh, version 0.3. Um, which, you know, no promises. I don't know when or how we're going to release that, but hopefully what would be nice is that 0 0.3 is out by the time of the next um, Honey Magic conference in Riga. Um, I thought you would never shut up. Damn, yeah. dude, those are, those are, th that's a feature I, or two. I never stop. <laughs> sorry, sorry, was that? <laughs> yeah, that was, that was a lot of features. Holy, yeah. holy shit.
Yeah, Dude, yeah. Con congrats, man. That was a yeah. massive overhaul. Yeah, yeah. It's a lot. It, was a, it was a lot of work. So it was about, um, I think, probably about eight months of work for the second release or since, basically since the October. Oh, so I'm not sure exactly how much time. And uh, a lot of the work was done by um, Etan Arrivé, which works for Bull Bitcoin. But um, he, uh, his job at Bull Bitcoin is to work exclusively or mostly exclusively on Siphonode. And also um, a developer called SKP, which you may be following on Twitter. He's, he's pretty, pretty active there too. Um, and both have been doing an incredible job. And SKP has been uh, you know, dedicating a lot of his uh, time for free for the project. So, um, and really giving us a big, massive boost um, on all the features there. So uh, thanks a lot, SKP, and thanks to Sen for doing such a good job. Yeah, yeah, dude, awesome. Okay, a lot to unpack here. Um, well, so first of all, again, like so many great features and very important, right, to, to build this out. And it's, it's a shame that we're, like, this is such a fundamental basic tool, so to say, right? And it's kind of a shame that we don't yet have it. Mm -hmm. Right, but so it's awesome now that we do have it. Mm -hmm. So that that's already great. And yeah. uh, we, we talked a bit earlier about um, you know some things that you wanted to do with uh, with like sending money directly to a change address, and that change address uh, or or sorry, so the change address directly being a XPub of another wallet. And you could use that, for example, to send the change back to your hardware wallet, or even better, right, to send that change back to Wasabi, for example, for coin joins. Uh, and of course, that is a, a great feature. And you said that you try or you you did a lot of development on that specific feature. But then all of a sudden, uh, with version 0 0.18 in Bitcoin Core, well, okay, not all of a sudden, but there is the hardware wallet interface. Uh, and that does exactly that with really, like, really intuitive, really uh, full feature-rich um, setup. So I guess and the question here would be, uh, especially like here, you with Cypherpunk on building on top of these awesome softwares. Um, do you think that it would be better to have these features directly in the in the core underlying infrastructure, or then on services on top like Cypherno? Um, I think that the the Bitcoin Core project was definitely a design. Or I mean, I'm not a Bitcoin Core developer. I, I follow the space, but I think a lot of the philosophy and design is made to have uh, these extra features to be modular on top of Bitcoin Core and not within Bitcoin Core directly. And I guess the biggest clue we can have that this is the case is that um, uh, the Bitcoin Core project itself, uh, specifically Andrew Chow from Chaincode Labs, developed this, this new um, library called the Hardware Wallet Interface. Um, and they didn't put that in Bitcoin. Uh, they did put that in Bitcoin Core. And it's meant to be um, you know, added as a kind of package or plugin on top of Bitcoin Core. Um, there's many reasons to do that. The, 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 the most obvious reason is that um, uh, that's not necessarily a feature that everybody wants. And, you know, it's not like it has a lot of trade-offs, but I mean, every time you introduce new stuff, there is a security risk, there's some risk in there. So, I mean, uh, the, core the core functions of Bitcoin are, are, are already in it, right? I mean, uh, Bitcoin Core itself doesn't need the additional uh, functions in order to be a, a full node. Um, and this is the kind of stuff that should be done uh, externally. And in this specific instance, I mean, this just goes to show how good and how reactive Bitcoin Core is, the Bitcoin Core team is, um, uh, it, to, to the market and to the needs of the industry. Um, I never, like, communicated this this need to Bitcoin Core developers, and it, it seems like I don't I don't know how they they came up with the uh, with the idea or motivation to do that at the exact right time that we were doing it, and we needed that ourselves. So that was that was really neat. Um, so specifically, this feature was developed because we are really uh, trying to figure out how people actually do get de-anonymized um, in the Bitcoin system. And by de-anonymized, I don't mean that uh, uh, f necessarily from uh, uh, from governments, but all, uh, although although that too, but uh, but also from from uh, from Bitcoin businesses that are that are looking at the blockchain in order to gain uh, market intelligence data and stuff like that. And uh, uh, one of the really sneaky ways that we found people get de-anonymized is when uh, uh, you're doing an exchange withdrawal. For example, the exchange usually uh, is going to be sending bitcoins to you, and is going to be sending a, a little piece of change to himself. Um, so you can actually send a UTXO um, to the change uh, of the exchange uh, and that UTXO, if the exchange is not uh, having some kind of dust uh, removal uh, system, um, that UTXO is going to be added to probably someone else's uh, withdrawal and you're going to be able to see, oh, okay, so uh, whoever is having this UTXO that I'm tracking is also a user of that exchange. Um, so. I was trying to figure out a way uh, to send the change uh, outside of Bitcoin Core when you're using Bitcoin Core, 
um, so that it would go to Wasabi before going back into Bitcoin Core. So it's kind of like every change output would be mixed before it is used again. So never use again a change output that, has or, uh, that hasn't already been mixed. And that was like, that was kind of hard to, to figure out. And then uh, I realized that the way that they did the hardware wallet integration um, requires Bitcoin Core to send change outputs to an external address, which is the hardware wallet's address. So um, instead of having to, so we didn't do a lot of work on it, specifically building it, which is great because uh, they did an amazing job, but we put a lot of, of time and thought into figuring it out um, and uh, Bitcoin Core did the job. So um, what we're going to be doing with that is we're probably just going to take the hardware wallet interface library itself um, and iterate in CypherNode. So normally what you would do is uh, in order to leverage this feature, you would need to download Bitcoin Core and you need to download this additional library and then set it up. Um, so that's going to be a, a, a library within CypherNode. So when you launch your CypherNode, um, I'm not sure if we're going to be able to do that before 0.3, hopefully. Uh, we have other priorities, as we might talk about, uh, which are, which are uh, the hardware wallet interface is definitely a priority, but uh, privacy and coin join are, are, are more pressing priorities. Um, but this is definitely something that is going to be uh, put in there. In, in any case, we wanted CypherNode to be the, the back end for the cold card wallet. So the cold card wallet doesn't have his own backend. Um, right now, it's using uh, Electrum um, and uh, Electrum server, um, which is totally okay. Um, but uh, we thought that we could you know, have something a little bit more simple and a little bit more, uh, I guess, light uh, than, than that, that setup. Um, so uh, Bitcoin Core already did all the work for that to happen, uh, which was to introduce uh, the partially signed Bitcoin transaction improvement in, in Zorpin 17, which was huge. And um, with this new library uh, that, they, that they did, what that means is that people are going to be using um, their hardware wallets directly with Bitcoin Core through this little tiny middleware. Um, and since it's bundled in CypherNode, it's going to be really easy to integrate. Uh, yes, awesome, right? And just the work of the core devs is insane, right? I mean, yeah, yeah PSPT, HWI, like they're just all these features coming are so... Like, it's still infrastructure, right? It's, it's really base layer, but there's still so much efficiency to be gained, so much more advanced feature. And we're not even just talking about like yet alone Schnorr and, and all like the, the really heavy research and the taproot and all that, but but just the basic infrastructure. We still need to do so much more building, and and yeah, they do an outstanding job, right? Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you are not just uh, like a software developer; you're actually an entrepreneur, right? providing a, pro a service to to your customers and helping them to solve problems, um, and that's Bull Bitcoin, right? The Bitcoin exchange in Canada. And no question. Um, and so the question would be, well, first of all, right, you, you, work on, um, you, you work on CypherNode and all that stuff because you need it, right? You scratch your own itch. Uh, and so then how do you use CypherNode itself, but then also um, other uh, beautiful Bitcoin software, like, for example, Wasabi, as you've mentioned earlier? Uh, right. So um, uh, we, we did build a cipher node for ourselves first and foremost, um, and not necessarily uh, saying that like, you know, we, we build it for us and you can have it. I mean, the, the idea here is that um, uh, we uh, are, I guess, the, the archetype of kind of a like garage startup that started like, you know, kind of like a garage startup, you know, self-funded, bootstrapped, um, not a lot of budget. Um, and uh, try, trying to, to, to create a nice product. And when we started out, we instantly did like kind of all the startups and we went to third uh, software as a service uh, providers. Um, and uh, we realized that that put us on the hook to be basically the, the slaves of these uh, third parties uh, when it comes to the consensus rules and when it comes to, you know, we needed to trust them. Um, and that was, that was definitely not an option. Um, so, uh, in, in, in our system, we have, uh, we, have a, uh, we, we need to have a Bitcoin software that's running uh, programmatically. Um, and we also have some Bitcoin software that we use manually. Um, so the idea here was to remove as much as possible the manual work involved in, in using Bitcoin and make it as programmatic and automated as possible. And um, that's basically the way that it's, it's headed. Um, so I guess the, the most important thing that we are trying to do is to automate the usage of the Wasabi wallet. So the Wasabi wallet was, uh, is an absolutely amazing tool. It's fantastic. Um, but it, it is actually developed as a desktop app. 
And um, it is kind of designed and developed to be used by the everyday person. I mean, it was actually created to be super easy to use by noobs on an everyday basis. Um, however, it, it's kind of hard to scale in, in an enterprise setting because obviously um, you don't want to have, you know, some guy, you know, operating Wasabi Wallet all day and doing manual operations there um, when you could automate that with software. Um, so one of the big takeaways for me from this conference was those discussions that we were having with uh, the Wasabi team in order to uh, think and brainstorm and strategize on how to kind of automate a Wasabi. And the reason why we want to do that or we would want to do that uh, generally speaking is because um, the, uh, the services and, and exchanges and, and businesses um, are, are doing a lot more transactions than end users. I mean, that, that's just a fact. And that's obviously normal. I mean, uh, are you doing more transactions than Coinbase? Obviously not. Like uh, these, these services like Bills, we do a lot of transactions. And I think one of the end goals that, uh, one of the stress goals that I want to see is I want to see a very large percentage of all the transactions in Bitcoin to be coin joint transactions, right? So if uh, only the end user that are doing occasional spending or occasional um, hygiene of their UTXOs using uh, Wasabi Wallet um, and the enterprises don't have access to uh, a, a scalable or automated way to use Wasabi Wallet, then we're never going to really reach that. Or, I mean, it, it is going to take a much longer time in order to reach uh, that stretch goal of having a, a large percentage of coin joint transactions in there. And, you know, a thing that that we, we need to think about is, I mean, I know that we have a very low type reference in Bitcoin and we definitely are conservative and we don't want to, you know, rush stuff. And I mean, uh, we're, I think we're all quite confident that Bitcoin is secure, robust enough and good enough. Uh, you know, it's kind of in inevitable that it's going to take off. However, um, one thing is that uh, the, the Bitcoin blockchain is immutable and it's transparent. Okay. And uh, right now people are doing transactions and these transactions are never going to disappear. So every time, every minute, every hour that we wait in terms of privacy is something that we're never going to get back. Like the transactions that you did uh, previously that were not coin joint transactions are always going to be there. And it doesn't matter if you switch to coin join later. I mean, that, that trace is already there. So, um, you know, when I'm looking at uh, the priorities for development um, and I'm trying to think, think, okay, do I want lightning or do I want to put some effort on coin join? Uh, both are amazing projects, the two biggest projects, but my feeling is, okay, we should probably make sure that the people who are already using Bitcoin are protected um, before we, we make uh, Bitcoin scalable for the masses. I mean, this is my personal opinion. Um, so this was kind of my, my goal here. And I think we've, we've obtained that goal. Um, one of the things that is really great with those, uh, those, those conferences is, you know, the brainstorm we had. I mean, we were looking at every single way to crack it, to uh, how would it not work? Does it make sense? Does it not make sense? Like really going through all the use cases and be like, oh, no, actually that's useless and going back and going forward and going back. And then in the end, I mean, uh, we, we ended up with a, a very simple and neat uh, solution in order to streamline the usage of CoinJoin. And I'm very, very excited uh, to be working on it. And uh, I've already uh, talked to the developers of Siphonode and everyone's pretty excited. And uh, again, as soon as we go home, this is probably what we're going to be doing. I mean, uh, and I, I probably should be uh, uh, um, not spending too much time on free and open source project as a kind of as an entrepreneur working uh, on an exchange. But I mean, this is so exciting. I just can't stop myself. Oh, yeah, uh, absolutely. The, the brainstorming session that we had with Nopara uh, to, to really think about through, like how do business with high frequency of transactions actually use for some? And I mean, there, like, there, there are things that uh, like very minor or minor, but very uh, wide ranging implementation details that you really have to take care. For example, every single wallet can have at a maximum seven inputs to the coin join, right? For the regular user, no issue. But for you with like several transactions per hour, right? Several UTXOs coming in that wallet. Like this is really a serious limitation for you. And I mean, the limitation is not just Wasabi. I mean, there's just a, a limit on how large can a transaction be inside a, a block, right? Uh, and, and really figuring all these details out that, that are still a pain point uh, is, is, is quite difficult and not too easy, right? And well, I would like to say that our conversation was one of the most awesome conversations that I have. But like, I mean, the, this entire conference was like at that level, yeah. right? It was, it was mind blowing. I think yesterday I, we started at 8 a.m. and we ended at 2 a.m. and there was no break. Like you, <laughs> you, you, we didn't stop, right? And it was, it was all on this very, very detailed and very uh, 
action oriented and how can we apply the software and make it even better and usable right um and of course and you also said that uh, you are you as an entrepreneur and first and foremost, the business, right? That's, that's how you make your living. That's how you provide for your family and, and of course, for your employees and, and your children, generations to come, right? Um, but of course, you, you do contribute a lot to open source uh, software. And that's why I call you and me both ethical open source entrepreneurs. Uh, because yeah, we, we realize the importance of this open source software, but it's, it's not standard, right? And you have one employee on payroll 24-7 just to work on CypherNode. Right. Um, and of course, like the, the main reason you do it is, is that you want the software yourself. Um, but why would you then not just close source it? Right. Why is this, this need to have open source and to contribute back? Yeah, well, there's, there's, there's many reasons. I think the, the most important reason, um, uh, I mean, or I guess the, the most logical and rational reason, um, is that, it allows you to have better software period, right? So um, open source software is generally better than non-open source software because you have just more sets of eyes that are looking at it and more sets of arms that are working on it, right? Um, uh, so I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, when uh, the, the contributions that SKP has put uh, in CypherNode are amazing. This is definitely stuff that we would never have had time to do or we, know, we, we wouldn't have it in time. Um, we got a lot of security reviews um, from well-known Bitcoin security experts that would never even had looked at our code. Um, and if, if we had wanted a review, we would have paid a lot of money to get that review. Um, also, I mean, I am an entrepreneur first and foremost, and obviously the, the, the revenues and income that we make from our business are, are, uh, are, are the priority. But I mean, we are also all holders, right? And we're also, um, and we're also activists. I mean, I started as, a, as an activist, um, I didn't start a business until, you know, a few years of, of being in Bitcoin. Actually, I was working for nonprofits and I was doing, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the advocacy, the education and all that kind of stuff. A, a lot of um, a, a lot of you out there are probably doing the same stuff that I was doing, you know, going to the organizing meetups and uh, writing blog posts. And, you know, every, every time a, a journalist uh, would say something stupid about Bitcoin, I would, I would try to get on the news and do the opposite as, and see the opposite thing. Um, and one of the things that I realized um, you know, thinking about, and I had been involved with uh, some nonprofits such as the Bitcoin Foundation, um, and I and I saw kind of like what failed, and I, I mostly saw what the big problem was to solve, and the problem that I saw was the redundancy of effort by a lot of people. So I mean, um, if you have open source software, what that allows to do, it, let, let's say that, let's put business aside for a second, and let's say that I don't like to say that all the Bitcoin open source devs are on the same team, but Imagine Bitcoin as a corporation just for a moment, all right? Like pretend it's not, you know, pretend it's a corporation and pretend like I'm, I'm you know, Satoshi and I'm the CEO of Bitcoin. I'm trying to allocate resources. Like what I'm seeing is a lot of different departments and divisions that are just doubling the work, right? And there's a communication problem be between them. You know, you're, you're doing the same work as this guy. Why don't you just, just meet and like work on the same project and, and so forth? Um, so the idea of open sourcing CypherNode was specifically, listen, okay, um, we're going to do this. We need this. And we're motivated enough to pay for it, okay? Um, so please, we're going to spend a year on it. Please don't spend a year working on something the same, okay? Because what we can actually do is let me do the work for you, and then you can do other work, and then we can integrate that work into ours, and you can integrate uh, our work into yours. So we're going to all be a lot more productive. Um, and, and also, I mean, uh, realistically, if, I, if I'm being truly, truly honest, I mean, um, if, you talk, if you talk about branding and marketing in the Bitcoin space, I mean, uh, Bitcoin open source, and, and this is a call to entrepreneurs and other businesses, I mean, you cannot, you cannot imagine um, the, the attention that, that Bull Bitcoin is getting because of CypherNode. And I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't a goal. Like, we didn't do that to get, uh, uh, to get attention. But I mean, it is driving attention to, to our project. And that's great because... I mean, uh, people in Bitcoin are very like picky consumers, right? So um, it's kind of like uh, we're kind of like the, uh, I guess the the social justice warrior hipsters of software. I mean, whenever we're picking a product, we're not just looking at uh, we're not just looking at the price of the product, and we're just we're not necessarily also just looking at the quality of the product, but we're looking at is the company ethical, right? And it's it's a it's a big it's a big component of a, a consumer's decision in Bitcoin. Um, you know, why is it that uh, everybody's kind of pushing for, I don't know, for Cash App instead of Coinbase? Something that, this is something that we've seen kind of emerge. And I mean, if, if you look at Cash App and Coinbase, I mean, 
looks like pretty similar services to me. I'm not American. I've, I haven't used them. Uh, I haven't used Cash App, so I, I don't really know. But I mean, it seems to me like a lot of the reasons why people are pushing Cash App, it's, it's because of the uh, Bitcoin only aspect of Cash App. And it's because of the, the Jack, Jack Dorsey's endorsements of Bitcoin. And also mostly because of uh, Coinbase fucking up, right? And, and doing unethical things. Um, so it, it, it is, it's kind of a proof of your ethics, right? So I mean, if you if you're going to be a Bitcoin company that's trying to compete with others on ethics, um, I mean, what, what more uh, ethical thing to do than actually open source that? And, and the last part of it is, uh, I mean, we do believe in scan the game um, and we believe in the concept of uh, speculative philanthropy, which is that um, you uh, investing in open source projects is an, is an investment in Bitcoin itself. So I, I don't really consider... Um, Cypher node to be an expense, uh, although it is, it doesn't have IP. So I mean, all the money that I put in there, there's no thing or why for me personally as an entrepreneur, but the way that I see it is if, uh, by investing in Cypher node, I'm investing in the decentralization of the Bitcoin network and the decentralization of the Bitcoin network is what gives it value. So clearly if I'm investing in Cypher node, I'm kind of investing in the value of Bitcoin and ultimately the return that I'm expecting from Siphonode, the, the, the final motivation is I'm, I generally think that Siphonode might increase the price of Bitcoin or might increase the value proposition of Bitcoin in the same way that I believe that all the other open source projects out there like Wasabi is, in, is increasing the value proposition of Bitcoin. I mean, uh, Wasabi just destroyed the Monero. I mean, no, not, not, not at all, not, not, not specifically, but, but I mean, uh, to, to, to be honest, like if, if you look at the way that, uh, that uh, if you look at Wasabi and CoinJoin and the privacy that we can get from Wasabi, and if you look at an end-to-end -end, uh, um, kind of supply chain of Monero and Bitcoin, people say, oh, Monero is more anonymous or more private, it has more value for that than, than, than Bitcoin. Well, I don't know about that at all because uh, um, the act of uh, changing from Monero to Bitcoin um, and having to switch back to USD as well and all of that um, in enters a lot of points of de-anonymization. Um, enter Wasabi in Bitcoin on top of Bitcoin using the Bitcoin unit of account exclusively. Um, I believe that you know a successful and and good strategy using CoinJoin is much more anonymous than what you would get. Um, you know, taking into account the poor liquidity of of, of the privacy shit coins. Um, so if you look at the market cap or the valuation, don't look at those metrics, but I mean, if you look at the, the people's valuations of privacy coins and what Wasabi has achieved, I mean, strictly speaking, like all of that valuation should flow back into Bitcoin. Um, so, you know, open source is, it's not, it's, it's not just altruism. It's definitely a good business strategy to have a, a, an open source ecosystem. It's also a great way to recruit people. It's also a great um, education tool and training tool for, develop, for our own developers. And also, to be honest, um, I mean, it's, it's cheaper than the Lambo and it's much more fun than the Lambo. I mean, it is a bull, right? Uh, yeah, so yeah. I guess, <laughs> well, you know, but great points that you bring up. And well, we say that Bitcoin is trustless, but it's not, right? It really is not. We trust each other. We have to, right? There is social engagement, social interaction uh, between us individuals here uh, in Bitcoin. And so the question is then, how can we build up this trust? How can you build up your reputation? Well, if you do Coinbase, right, you're not going to have jack shit for reputation. And we're going to boycott you and delete Coinbase, right? This is really what will happen if you fuck up with Bitcoiners. And when, when, you, when you break our trust uh, and, and you burn it down to the core, as Coinbase did several times and over and over and over, uh, we are going to destroy you, quite literally, right? But then on the complete other side, we have ethical open source entrepreneurs like you putting skin in the game, right? Investing back into the project. And then that leads to that. I trust you. Like, I trust that you will never steal from anyone. Like, I know that, right? And I'm pretty damn certain that you will not break my trust in this here. And then with, with me having this trust in you, I have no issues whatsoever uh, to recommend bull Bitcoin to anyone who is in your jurisdiction, right? Uh, for forgetting that. And like on the complete opposite, I would never do that with, with, with Coinbase, right? So this is, as you said, it's, it's tremendous marketing, right? I, I'm, I'm sure that this, this really has probably put a lot of new clients of yours on your radar. Uh, and, and it just, as you said, helps out the, the overall Bitcoin ecosystem. And because we are all hodlers, the incentives are very well aligned. Um, and 
I guess it was kind of missing with the internet, right? Um, that, that we did not really have this value appreciation uh, of the individuals doing the work on the internet because there was not no currency where they could benefit through the Cantillon effect uh, and, and from, from getting the sound money first by contributing, by putting skin in the game, right? If you just, if, if you, for example, just would have bought Bitcoin in the early days and just launch it and not done anything, right? You probably would have spent it on your Lambo, right? Uh, and, and then you would not have any. But those that are productive, those that have skin in the game, those that do solve problems for others, those will be the ones that are prosperous, especially in the long term, mm-hmm. right? Um, so we, we've we already talked about a lot, but also what, what I'm really interested in, in, how can the individual use Cypher? Like, so do you need to have like huge server, server farms in order to run it? Or, uh, or could you run it on, on something really uh, minimalistic from the hardware side? Uh, yeah, before I get into that, I just want to share a, a, a quick anecdote about that. And it's a great point. Um, uh, I think a year and a half ago, or two years ago, I met a open source developer that worked on a fairly well-known early Bitcoin open source project um, that, had a, that had a lot of impact for a lot of people a while back. And um, I was talking to him and I was like, so, you know, do you have a job? Like, what do you do? And he's like, no, I just work on that open source project. And I'm like, so, you know how do you get income? Like, why, why do you do that? Uh, and he told me basically, well, you know, I've been in Bitcoin for a long time and Bitcoin took care of me. So now it's my turn to take care of Bitcoin, right? So um, this, this idea, and you're totally correct to say that, uh, that that's what was missing with, uh, with, the, with the internet as well. So, um, uh, and another point about trust, and I mean, you're very correct to say that, uh, that uh, we do trust people in Bitcoin. Uh, there, there is no doubt about it. Like, if you're using bills, um, even though it's a non-custodial service, like if you're using bills and you're paying a bill with Bitcoin and you're sending a Bitcoin to my app, I mean, uh, it, <laughs> Bitcoin transactions are irreversible, okay? And, and when you send a Bitcoin to someone, uh, the nature of trust uh, changes dramatically, right? So uh, as long as it's in your hand, you're, you're good. But as soon as it goes away, you're like, you know, you're a little bit stressed out. I mean, it does happen sometimes that users of bills, you know, they, they send us Bitcoins and they kind of freak out. They're like, fuck should I trust this guy? And, and then they write me a message right after in the, in the, in the support. Uh, like, uh, are you going to scam me? I don't know. I, I, fuck, did I, I don't know why I sent you Bitcoins. I don't even know you. Nah, 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 it's my precious Bitcoin. Um, so it's a very important to, to trust. And the, the things like uh, Siphonode uh, reduce the trust requirements. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to minimize trust. And um, uh, I, I'm going to also share maybe a little preview. This is kind of a, this might be a, a a premiere ooh, of a feature that's, uh, that we're developing. So um, I've been like fascinated and uh, obsessed with Bitcoin, invo- in- Bitcoin invoicing for a long time. And the reason I am is because obviously I run a payment processing company and we send invoices, but also because the invoice or the payment request is, is the interface by which most people interact with Bitcoin. I mean, when you're using Bitcoin, what are you doing? You're paying, like you're scanning a web page, right? Th- think of how you use Bitcoin on a daily basis and like, like, probably half of it is is you pointing your camera at at your laptop screen right to an invoice that you're going to pay um so it's a really critical part of the of the of the experience and um one thing that we are using cyphernode for and uh, uh, one of the reasons why we built cyphernode was to create a something that i call the geratum protocol so the geratum protocol is a is an invoicing a bitcoin invoicing protocol that i've been uh, developing for the past 3 years um and uh, the idea of that is I want people to, um, I can't make it fully trustless. Okay. I can't uh, have a, 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 it's, a, you can't have a smart contract, a real smart contract. I mean, it's, it's almost impossible. Uh, as, as soon as you're, you're leaving the, the Bitcoin universe into the physical realm, for example, a fiat to Bitcoin exchange can't be enforced with a smart contract. Um, but I started to look at, uh, at uh, you know, to, to research smart contracts and I, uh, I became uh, really interested in the concept of a Ricardian contract, which is a contract which is cryptographically uh, enhanced, humanly readable, and um, uh, can be parsed by a computer. So what we're going to do with CypherNode is whenever we create an invoice on bills, um, you know, you, you got elements of, of an invoice, such as uh, the payment request, the exchange rate, the price, the Bitcoin address of the recipient, um, the expiry of the invoice, and what the invoice is going to be for. So what, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to link a payment request to an exchange rate and to a counterparty, some kind of payment that's going to be coming out. So using CypherNode, we create a, a payment request. Um, we, uh, okay, so we create a payment request. Um, and we uh, take the uh, last block hash that is available in the Bitcoin blockchain using the CypherNode API. 
Um, so we have this, this payment request, and then we add the last block hash, and we're going to take it, and we're going to sign it with our PGP key. So the first thing that we do is by signing it with our PGP key, um, we are the only ones who own that PGP key, so that invoice could only have been generated by me. Um, so I cannot repute, it's not reputable, right? Uh, and also this, prote this prevents a man in the middle attack. Um, this is kind of an alternative for BIP70, right? Um, and this uh, uh, man in the middle attack, phishing attack, uh, repudiation. Um, and then we take that PGP key, uh, signature, sorry, um, we hash it and we timestamp it using open timestamps, uh, which is another feature we have in Siphonode. It's pro possibly one of the coolest uh, Bitcoin projects out there. It's definitely the coolest non-monetary uh, Bitcoin project out there. And what that, what that does is, so we have a, a PGP signed invoice um, where uh, we signed that this was our Bitcoin address and we signed that if, like, if one Bitcoin sent, is sent to that Bitcoin address before this time, I owe you something. Um, and then uh, by putting the block hash in there, we prove that this signature could not have existed before the time of the, that block hash. For example, I could not have guessed that block hash in advance, so clearly I cannot put that block hash in a PGP signature before that block. Um, and since I also timestamp um, that, uh, that signature, um, I can prove that uh, that signature definitely did exist at a certain point in time. So wait a minute. So I can prove that a signature did not exist before, say, block 100. And I can say that for sure that uh, signature existed before, uh, after block 102. So again, that signature did not exist before block 100 and definitely existed after block 102. What does that mean? It means that the signature was created between block 100 and block 102. So as far as I'm concerned, this is the first time ever in possibly human history that you are able to irrefuti irrefutably prove the time window during which a digital signature was generated. And this is kind of like just an example of the amazing features that you know, the Bitcoin time chain or clock is, uh, is able to do. And all of these tools that we're developing are because we have middleware such as Siphonode, which make it possible for us to transform these crazy concepts into prototypes. And, uh, and as a result, we're able to create an experience which dramatically minimizes the trust for the user. So, I mean, and, and what this does in our system, for example, is that if I screw you over, for example, if I do take the Bitcoin and run away, then you have a signature and you have proof of when it was generated and you have proof it was signed by me. So you can take that to court and you can enforce, uh, you can enforce uh, uh, the contract legally, right? So I'm, uh, it allows us to generate proof that we give to our users against us so that, um, I mean, uh, uh, if you don't trust me, well, at least I'm going to give you evidence uh, of my crime uh, in advance if I do commit a crime. Um, so, so this is really exciting because this is something, something that we were prototyping for a while and the idea of uh, a siphon old makes that uh, really easy to do and really scalable and really easy to reproduce by anyone. So you don't really have an excuse now. If SiphonOde exists and does that, uh, why don't you use it? <laughs> you know? All right, so uh, what is SiphonOde uh, built for? Um, how do people use SiphonOde? So SiphonOde was built first and foremost for developers. And by developers, I don't mean Bitcoin developers. I mean web developers, junior developers. Um, if you're a junior developer, you know, you're fresh out of college, you're 19, you're 20, you're developing an app or prototype, and you're trying to you know, build a Bitcoin application, there's a lot of things that can be difficult. You can screw things up, you can screw up security. Um, you're used to integrating web APIs, and now you have this weird RPC, which you don't really know what it does. And in order to really fully leverage the Bitcoin RPC, you need to make multiple RPC calls with some weird configurations. And it's kind of hard to like, get a grip on that. So uh, we already got a grip on that. So we abstracted away all those, all those complexities. So it's built for developers and it's a junior, you can use it with a junior level. It's also built for project managers, right? So I mean, if you're, if you're a Bitcoin savvy person and you know you want some kind of feature or you, you are developing something and you're looking for a solution uh, uh, to build a product, um, Cyphernode is a great, great, uh, you know, you can see it as an alternative to all these frameworks on Ethereum that make it really easy to develop apps on Ethereum. Um, so we just wanted to make it super easier for, 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 for project managers or for entrepreneurs um, to, to choose Bitcoin, right? To, to, to see that the, the, the cost of integrated Bitcoin is very, very low. One of my philosophies is get them while they're young, right? This is how Ethereum was so successful is by developing those tools that made it super easy to transform a junior JavaScript dev into a $1 million, $100,000 a year, you know, Solidity, a smart contract developer, right? So uh, uh, the allure of being able to become a smart contract developer using these abstracted frameworks, which really are, 
are just kind of like the same as web programming languages, got a lot of people into Ethereum while they were young and at a hackathon or in high school or na na na. And then once they pick a technology, they have like this uh, this bird. Yeah, they have the skin in the game and they have a kind of a burden and a legacy and a technical debt kind of. And it's hard like if you build if you start using something like Ethereum and then you realize later on that it sucks. I mean, it's kind of hard to change your entire backend. And you know, if you hadn't started with Ethereum, you would start with Bitcoin, but it was so easy in the beginning and you're just gonna stick with it, right? So we want people to choose Bitcoin uh, in the beginning and make it really, really easy. Um, eventually this is gonna be uh, for end users as well, right? So um, Cypher-Node is a backend application and um, we initially thought that uh, we initially wanted a lot of people to build apps on top of it, including a web wallet, including uh, you, you can build your own web wallet on top of Cypher-Node. You can build uh, a hardware wallet interface on top of Cypher-Node. Uh, you can build an explorer. You can build a time stamping application or a dashboard to monitor your node. Um, but I mean, realistically, um, we, already, we already know what we want. So instead of letting the, the ecosystem develop these white label applications, we're going to develop them as a white label kind of like you can use this as a web wallet application if you want to do it. So um, one day, the goal for CypherNode is that when, when you're running it, um, you're going to, uh, it already has a dashboard, but when, you, when you're running CypherNode, you're going to visit your CypherNode interface and there's going to be the graphical user interface for all the advanced controls that you have in the Bitcoin software, software stack. So not only, um, so you're going to be using CypherNode, uh, the, the CypherNode dashboard as your wallet, um, because if you can connect to, you know, Bitcoin Core and see Lightning via API, and if you can via API, you know, tell Bitcoin Core, send Bitcoins there or generate me an invoice or stuff like that. Um, why can't I create a, a tiny app with my API that has a button that you send and receive? Um, so, so the objective of CypherNode is to be a whole end-to-end -end suite um, for deploying and using. So, so you should not necessarily use any other tool than CypherNode in the future. Um, they're all going to be bundled up together and they're all going to be secure in the same environment. So the end goal of CypherNode is that every user is going to be able to use it as a, as a web app. Think of, for example, uh, the Zap wallet. Right, so Zap is kind of like uh, is very much the same philosophy. You know, you're running your your L and D node at home, and Zap is like the really nice user interface that's uh, that's connecting uh, on top of uh, L and D. Same as Spark. You know, Spark is that user interface, which is a uh, uh, so in the case of Spark and C Lightning, you you can kind of think of uh, the Cypher node as uh, uh, the uh, the charge server, right? So you have C Lightning, Charge, and Spark. Um, in our case, we don't use Charge because we do the same thing as Charge, um, but we do use Lightning and Spark. So, I mean, we're using Spark right now, um, but we're going to add a few features either to Spark or either we're going to make another one and integrate Spark in it or we're going to redo it and we're not really sure. So, I mean, eventually it's going to be a, a end user product. So, um, you're going to be running your own full node. You're going to be running your own user interface um, and you're going to be connecting your own hardware wallet to your own user interface, your own node. So, you're not going to be trusting anyone at any point in time. Um, which is fantastic. And so how, uh, what is the requirement to run CypherNode? I mean, right now in CypherNode, you got Lightning, Open Timestamp, you got uh, 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 um, uh, time sequencing servers, you got uh, API gateways, you got, I mean, is that really heavy? No, it's really not heavy. Um, the idea was to make it as minimal, as minimalistic as possible. So it requires less than one gig of RAM, which is, which is pretty awesome um, because um, the one gig of RAM limit is kind of a, you know, it, it's a very important milestone because uh, you have a lot of routers, for example, a lot of devices that are one gig specifically of RAM. So if you can get under one gig of RAM, you get access to running CypherNode on a lot of devices. Um, the computing requirements are basically the ones of Bitcoin Core. Um, there's nothing more, nothing less. I mean, it's essentially uh, the exact same requirements as Bitcoin Core and pretty much nothing else. Um, so CypherNode uh, runs very well on a Raspberry Pi. The only issue with Raspberry Pi is obviously the initial block download, but it runs on a Raspberry Pi. So I'll give you an example. So this is this is the Raspberry Pi that I brought to, uh, to uh, the Riga uh, Huddle Huddle conference. Um, if, if you have a close look at it, you'll see that it has kind of a little tail in the back that has three USB sticks. Um, so uh, these three USB sticks are each 128 gigs, and they are combined using a logical volume, um, uh, LVM, a logical volume uh, merger, I can't remember, uh, which basically is going to merge all these USB sticks into a drive. So if you have a bunch of USB sticks at home, like you can have like up to like, I don't know how many, uh, you can merge your USB sticks in order to get cheap storage for the blockchain. Um, so 
uh, the way that we're setting up CypherNode, so CypherNode runs on this. Um, you just kind of put it on the SD card. You download it on the SD card. Um, and uh, and uh, this is the blockchain over here. And um, what we do is we actually are configuring uh, the Raspberry Pi directly with our router. So, I mean, norm this is a kind of an advanced setup that we're going to, you know, do a lot more tutorials on, but we are actually configuring the router uh, with CypherNode so that as soon as CypherNode, uh, this Raspberry Pi is plugged into the Ethernet net, uh, network, um, uh, if it's the same, if it's using the same uh, router uh, Ethernet as your router, um, you're just going to go on your browser and type CypherNode Pi slash welcome. So there's not even like a website, right? Because it's, it's not accessing the internet, it's uh, accessing your local network. Um, so, uh, this Raspberry Pi can definitely run uh, the backend of Bitcoin. Um, so uh, obviously uh, we don't uh, do it on the live. Uh, it's o o only because, uh, really only because uh, um, of it, you know, powering off. I mean, this isn't the best device in the world, right? But the point is, um, if we weren't running it 24-7 and we need to have like 100% uptime, uh, this would be definitely good enough for most things. Um, and uh, it can run uh, on pretty much anything. The, uh, the goal is to one day make it run basically on a phone or uh, um, a, a, a router. Um, and one of the reasons also that uh, we're working at the router level as much as possible is that, okay, so, you know, a lot of the problems and issues with running a node are kind of counterintuitive. So you think about, okay, uh, using the command line sucks. Yeah, sure. No, no, no. There's also stuff that you need to do to run a node that is kind of hard for most people. That was the hardest part for me when I was a noob, which was the port configuration, right? Port configuration is, I mean, my, my first, you know, my first thought when I, when I looked at running a full node like a long time ago was like, what's a port? Okay, you need to go on your firewall. Fuck, what's a firewall? Okay, you need to go on your router. How do I go on my router? Uh, and you said that you know all these things. I had to. I was I was really bad at technology when I got to Bitcoin. I knew nothing, right? So that was that was really really hard. And then um, if you want to use Tor, then you get other complications. Um, so you need to play in the router, and you need to play on another device. So if we're gonna make users, if we're gonna streamline Bitcoin for the users, but not the router configuration, we're still asking them to do some really complicated stuff. So you can't really think of running a Bitcoin node in different, so for example, at the conference today, uh, during the weekend, um, whenever the, the internet was going down, um, people were offering hotspot to the speakers for the demo, but the, the, the speaker's like, oh no, well, I can't use your hotspot because I need to play with the router configurations and internet configurations, and oh shit, it's true, it's not, okay, so these are, these are the kind of things that we're thinking about. I mean, it's not just theoretical, it's like, I want someone to be able, I, I want really realistically a grandmother to be able to use this. And you might think it's crazy, but if your grandmother can use a smartphone, um, she will, I want her to be able to run uh, the cipher node. And the last thing uh, is that the only com intensive com time that, uh, the, the only computer resource intensive thing is the initial block download, um, which sucks on a Raspberry Pi, this is gonna be way too slow. Um, so one of the things that we're wor working on is the idea of using um, so you don't you don't want to use a, a cloud instance. Uh, uh, you want to use it as less as possible. Um, I like Keto's Keto Miner's uh, phrase. I think it's like, I trust metal. You know, he trusts the metal and he doesn't trust uh, someone else's metal. I really like that. But realistically, um, uh, it, it, you know, uh, a, a cloud instance. There's a reason why you pay for it. I mean, it's because it's really really good. And there's a reason why this is fifty bucks. Is because it's not very very good hardware. Um, so one of the things that we're working on is doing a trustless setup by which a user will will register for a cloud instance, um, kind of like the one-click deploy of BTC Pay that they have for Azure. Um, and uh, we're, we're looking at uh, uh, a cloud provider that we really like in Canada called Lunanode. And the idea here is that, okay, so you you can use a very, very high-powered server and rent it yourself and con control it yourself to do the initial block download, um, which you can do in about an hour and a half on the best, or two hours, I think, on, on you know, the most expensive server you can find, uh, which is 50 cents an hour. So as long, and once you download the, the blockchain, uh, you just stop using that server. It just costed you like $2 or something like that max. I, I think realistically, maybe an hour and a half might be a little bit optimistic. I think, but I think like two hours and a half, you would have like the full blockchain on a, you know, uh, on, a, on a 50 cent per hour virtual machine. And then once you've downloaded the blockchain for the first time yourself and you've verified it yourself and you've kind of, you know, made sure that everything was okay, um, you kill that virtual machine and you start using the Raspberry Pi. So that'll be fine, right? So if this is already synced, uh, it can run really easily. Uh, there's, no, there's no problem. So 
Um, uh, the idea is, yeah, so remove the trust points as much as possible to the point that everything is uh, trustless in using your own node uh, end to end. And um, uh, this will make you uh, not only more private and more secure, but uh, if there is a fork one day, a hard fork, or if there's the scaling debate or something like that, or if someone's trying to screw over with Bitcoin rules, um, this is kind of like... Uh, this is kind of like self-defense training. This is kind of like learning martial arts and, and getting you know, good equipment, right? So people, uh, you know, they were asking me during the day today and during the weekend, like, is it worth it, right? It was like, okay, let, let, let's talk about it. You know, is it worth it right now? Well, you might not think so, but it's the same concept of a martial arts training, right? It's like, is, is it worth it to train in martial arts? Well, I've never been attacked. No, 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 I don't know. There's police everywhere, no, no, no. Yeah, but if you're in a dark alley at night and you're getting mugged, um, it's too late to learn martial arts, right? You're not equipped, right? You don't have the thing. You better do it now. And uh, it's kind of like the uh, same thing as a condom, right? It's like, uh, you know, uh, you'd rather have it and not need it than need it and not have it. Um, and there's not, a, there's not a lot of cost for having it. Um, so that, that's the point. The point is to, is to make it accessible to everyone. And specifically for me, I was very frustrated for a long time um, as a hardcore Bitcoiner that understood a lot of the features that I wanted, I mean, up until a year ago, uh, I, I think I had a really good understanding of Bitcoin at a technical level, but I still was handicapped compared to like a core developer, right? So the core developer is like, he's like, you know, he's playing the note like a piano. He, I, I mean, he can do a lot of stuff. He can, he can leverage Bitcoin much more than me. And it's like, that's not fair. Like, why would, why would this guy be able to leverage the features of Bitcoin more than me just because he's good at programming? I mean. There's something as the distribution of, uh, I say that in English, uh, the, the distribution of labor, right? I mean, uh, so what? Uh, so only developers now are supposed to leverage the full features of Bitcoin? I mean, that, I don't think that's really fair. Um, so I wanted to control Bitcoin uh, in the same capacity as the best Bitcoin programmer without having to learn to program. Um, so that was the objective, and that's where we're going. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. And like the more you talk about Cypernote, the more awesome I find it. Uh, and I'm, I'm really, really excited to, uh, to test it off myself. And um, as you said, like the K2 Miner, uh, and, and we talked a lot this weekend again, because like, to, here's just another example of how much shit we get done during such a conference. Mm -hmm. I mean, for, like two, three days and how many like awesome projects and new relationships have you built? Mm -hmm. and, and how many awesome new uh, features have you, have you conceptualized, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so here, K2 Miner with the Noddle, uh, another one, right? We're like, yeah, exactly. Cypernote, Noddle, perfect perfect fit uh and it's 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 again something like i i don't code like not at all right but i still run a full node yeah cool right but what can i do with it uh, to be honest up until lightning i didn't do jack shit with my node right because well yeah okay transaction verification yeah but i mean you don't really have to do that right not many transaction get uh, get left owned especially if it's just a couple you know a couple satoshis the attack is so expensive so unlikely that you can kind of slag off there right mm -hmm. so there i wasn't really an economic node right i didn't use it too much i still was running one right um and and now that with the noddle and especially with lightning you actually need it because if you don't have a node for lightning you're fucked Right. But again, like, as you said, that's, that's like, I'm scratching like the, the, the surface of the surface uh, of, of what Bitcoin can actually do and what a full node actually can do. Mm -hmm. um, and I realized that, especially during UASF, where it was like, how the fuck do I run UASF node? Mm -hmm. Like, it's like, holy, like, I have no clue. Right. Mm -hmm. But it was unspeakably important. And uh, we will be back in that situa situation eventually. And if we do not have the feature set, if we do not have the tools for anyone, to precisely uh, choose how the node is running and to precisely choose uh, what features are being active or what consensus rules are being enforced, uh, then we are really in trouble, right? And again, trust minimization. Yes, these core devs are awesome. They dedicate a shit ton of time and attention and they deserve your utmost respect and gratitude for that. But still, I don't trust them. Like, I, I really don't do much, right? Uh, and then, as you said, they, they have such an immense uh, power differential, knowledge differential, um, that they have a much better understanding and, and application of, of this. And if we don't stay vigilant here, then this knowledge differential is going to increase, right? So how can we decrease it? Well, first and foremost, it's education, right? That's why I do these videos. And that's my part that I can do. But I mean, education is one part. Like, we need tools. We need, we need tools. They are a great uh, opportunity of decreasing that, that differential.
And as soon as we decrease it, right, where, where then both Gregory Maxwell might be using cipher node, uh, right? Or well, he's probably not going to yeah, like he's, he, probably, <laughs> he could probably do it all by himself. Like, yeah, exactly. But, yeah. Probably, yeah. probably. Yeah. Um, okay. But then let's say, like, well, okay, he's going to do like the crazy command. Like he's going to do all the calculations yeah. by hand. Let's not kid ourselves. Like he, he does mining by hand. <laughs> probably still damn fast. Yeah. Um, but yeah, then, then again, like if, if I use the same tools as, for example, Nopara, right? Not, not really a, a protocol dev, but still damn good. Uh, but if he has the same tool set as I have, and I'm as comfortable with these tools as he has, uh, then we, ha we have like, made ourselves peers again, right? We, we are on the same level again. Yeah, and that's immensely, immensely powerful. Um, so then again, like coming back to your ESF, and, and of course you are a crucial part. And again, thanks you for, for, for doing all that. Um, during doing USF, but how do you then see for such uh, consensus critical things that CypherNode might play a role? Um, well, that, that's why I built CypherNode. So, I mean, uh, the backstory of CypherNode uh, was that uh, it's something that I needed during USF and then have. And uh, after USF and Node2x, I did not believe that it was the end of the, uh, of the uh, I guess, the consensus wars. And uh, I believe that uh, we had, a, we had a, maybe a two-year, two two-, three-year period of peace, and then uh, we're going to have to go to the, to the barricades again. So the idea of CypherNode was to uh, get equipped for that uh, next challenge. And I think that next challenge might be, might be coming up, actually. So, I mean, it's been quiet for a little while, um, but we got some really amazing upgrades that are becoming into Bitcoin, uh, three specifically that were talked about this week. And we got Schnorr, we got a Sigash input, and we got uh, Taproot. Um, so um, as far as... We're cons I mean, as far as we know, these are going to be, or these are planned or being worked on as soft forks. Um, and one of the potential activation methods of it might be uh, BIP-8, uh, which is a uh, uh, minor, minor uh, signaling of readiness for a little while. And if they don't signal the readiness that they're going to be able to produce, for example, Schnorr compatible blocks, then the nodes are going to activate uh, that, uh, uh, that change. Wait, the nodes are going to activate that change? So, you know, who's going to be running the nodes, right? Um, is it going to be just a few companies running nodes or is it going to be everyone running nodes? And if you want a Schnorr compatible block, then you're going to be, you're going to have to run that, that, that node yourself. So, I mean, um, you know, be the change you want to be in Bitcoin. That's kind of the point. Like, so nobody's going to enforce the rules for you. Nobody's going to enforce those new rules for you. Um, and uh, I, I think some people, I mean, these are, again, these are non controversial technical changes to Bitcoin. I mean, the technology itself is not controversial. Schnorr has been around for a long time. Um, it's one of the most, uh, you know, uh, well-tested, reviewed, secure cryptographic uh, assumptions and, and signatures uh, schemes. So, um, uh, but however, Schnorr makes Bitcoin more scalable, more private, better. So anybody that actually wants Bitcoin not to be better uh, will want to oppose Schnorr. And um, people that uh, want to attack Bitcoin are much more savvy now than they were because they, they, uh, they've been uh, looking at the space and they see our weaknesses and they see our, uh, they probably have, a, if, if I was like in charge of attacking Bitcoin, I would look at the weaknesses and I would say the node centralization or the, the absence of a wide distribution of full nodes is probably the biggest, uh, the biggest flaw or no, sorry, or the biggest, I guess, uh, weakness in, in the Bitcoin ecosystem right now. Um, so in order to be able to enforce that, you need to be able to run your node. In order to be able to run your node and make a difference, you need to actually use your node on a day-to-day -day basis. Otherwise, it's just a, you know, a dead node that's just relaying transactions and you know, not doing much. And also, um, uh, as, I, as I discovered, um, a, lot of this, you know, a lot of people still use third-party services, right? Um, whether it's a hosted wallet, whether it's a payment processor, a block explorer, a, um, you know, a notification utility or anything like that, um, you're going to be using a lot of apps. And these apps are, are using other apps that are, so it's like, there's like a chain of third parties, right? So if, if you look at uh, uh, the average web application, it might be connected to a third, so you're using a third party, which is connected to a third party, which is running a node. Um, so uh, at least um, what I want the most is that every Bitcoin business should be running its full node. Uh, you, got, you got white label Bitcoin exchange startups that provide a, a, a white label framework for you to run your exchange. They run the node for you. How many exchanges are running on, uh, on this platform? Multiple, multiple hundreds. Uh, so you got one company in particular, which is running multiple, mu multiple hundreds of nodes for, mul for multiple hundreds of, of exchange and payment companies all over the world. That's just one. There's uh, um, the blockchain.info API. It's probably used in God knows how many 
many, many, many things. Uh, a lot of the Bitcoin ETMs are using third-party uh, uh, software providers. So um, ultimately, you know, you got like, uh, you know, realistically, you got like 20, 30, maybe 15 companies, 15 to 30, I guess, that are running nodes for about, you know, maybe 80% or more of the economic activity in Bitcoin. Um, only 0.3% of Bitcoin, I mean, I estimate the number of Bitcoin owners to be roughly around 25 million people. Where do I get this number out of my butt? I have no idea. It's just kind of like a feeling I have looking at, I mean, I, I am former economist and I, you know, I'm a researcher, so it's not completely pulled out of my ass. Let's just call it an educated guess. And uh, we know how many nodes there are though. We know there's about 70,000, 65,000 nodes in the network. So I mean, whether it's 0 0.2, 0 0.7 or 0.3% or 1%, I mean, it's a very tiny minority of people. Um, so we want to make sure that at least a lot of people are running nodes, as many individuals are running nodes. But most importantly, we want as much of the Bitcoin transaction volume to be run, uh, validated by sovereign users. May they be uh, the individual end user itself or may be the actual economic node um, that is doing the, the economic transaction. And we don't want anybody to be relying on a third-party block explorer ever. Um, and you know they can. It's it's not because they can defraud you, which they can. You know they can defraud you. Um, it's mostly because you will just be uh, the the slave to their decision. And you know, uh, look at Ethereum, right? Um, who's running a full node Ethereum? No one. What does that mean? Um, look at Augur. You know, Augur decentralized marketplace. Nah, nah, nah. Uh, no. Uh, is it a decentralized project but your market? No, because when you're running Augur, you need to select your node provider. What? Select your node provider? You mean known implementation? No, no, no. I mean known provider. So you cannot really use, uh, you can't, no, you can't use a dab. Like, let's be honest. Let's be serious here. Um, you know, you can't use Ethereum, uh, you know, realistically as a user um, unless you're running through a third party node provider. And what does that do? Well, you know, Infura is, uh, uh, and, you know, don't quote me on this because I, I think I read that on Twitter and, you know, <laughs> as a headline, I, it's always the truth, but I, I'm pretty sure that Infura is blacklisting the, uh, the, the illegal markets from 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 Augur, right? So um, if you're running, uh, so since Infura is running the node for you and you're connecting through them to Augur, um, they can't allow you to use an illegal service through their through their service, right? Um, so that's where the censorship comes from. Comes from right? The censorship comes from the 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 person that is running the node on your behalf. Um, so what's the ultimate difference between like, for example, conceptually in terms of consensus and in terms of emergent governance between Ethereum and Bitcoin is that in Ethereum, I mean, these companies are the ones that are making decisions. So who's making decisions? You know, it's consensus and it's the, uh, uh, why is consensus able to, uh, to make the decisions? You know, why, why is it that they have so much power? Well, it's because they run the nodes that almost all the apps are using, right? And if all of the apps are connected to, you know, one of the few service providers of nodes, I mean, if you have this, like three node providers that agree on something, like all of the apps are either gonna have to build their own backend, okay, like in like no time because, you know, there's a fork incoming, uh, or, or they're gonna just follow these guys. And then, uh, you know, is it really consensus when you have like a few startups that say, hey, we're moving over here. Um, and by the way, if you don't like us, you can stay on the old Ethereum chain that whatever. I mean, and I, and I mean, or and your investment is going to go to zero. And what is your leverage in order to be, to be able to say no? You have no leverage. Um, so, you know, if, if Bitcoin is only uh, validated by a few full nodes, it just becomes a centralized shitcoin. And I'm not interested in that. I'm not interested in that anymore. And if, if it becomes, you know, more and more centralized, I mean, okay, we think oh, it's impossible that we would ever challenge a 21 million coin limit. Really? Is it impossible? I mean, think, think, think long term, like think in 30 years. I mean, we're not going to be the main constituency of Bitcoin. It's going to be people who have no fucking clue what Bitcoin is. It's going to be people who have no fucking clue what sound money is. And even though they might benefit from Bitcoin, they might not know they benefit from 21 million. And you know, 21, 42, what's the difference? Just do times two, you know, one megabyte block, two megabyte block. What's the difference? Um, so one day, I mean, the reason why the 20, the reason why Bitcoin has value is because it's immutable. It's because it's sound money and it's because it's trustless and censorship resistant. These four uh, like core features uh, are not in the code. Like if you, uh, Dogecoin doesn't have those features and Dogecoin is a copy of Bitcoin. Um, so where do the features come from? Um, this network of self-enforcing uh, spontaneous consensus of nodes. Um, and that's what makes Bitcoin not a shitcoin.
perfectly well said. And, and that's exactly it. Like, it's not in the code. Like, we need to stay fucking vigilant. Because if we don't take care of ourselves, then others will take care of us. Uh, and we have that already. Um, it's called fascism. It's, it's the nanny state. Uh, and I don't fucking like that. Uh, and sovereign individuals uh, have the ultimate say in their actions and their decisions. Uh, and, and a slave does not, right? Uh, so then it doesn't really matter if, if, if it's Ethereum or not even the Ethereum Foundation is running a full node. Uh, or, or if it's Ripple, where if you want to run a full node, they ship it per UPS, right? So if you have to beg uh, to someone uh, in order for him to defend your property rights, uh, then, well, guess what? He's not going to do that. Um, and if you really want to defend your property rights in a sense that no one can fuck with you, then you need to take care of that yourself. And yes, it's not convenient. Yes, it's not easy. Yes, it's not La La Land. No, of course not. Uh, but that's exactly why we do it. Because it is not easy. Because it is actually fucking difficult. <laughs> But that's the entire fun in it, right? Right? I mean, I mean we, we, have, we have the easy thing where we, where we give control or where we try to give a responsibility to others. But guess what? You can never give responsibility to someone else. You always are the one responsible for your actions. And yes, you can try to give that away, but sooner or later, you're going to get fucked. Always. And in Bitcoin, we realize that. And we realize, no, we have to enforce a consensus ourselves we have to enforce the rules that we abide by uh, and if we don't then we get fucked right uh, and I, I guess like we, we see that for example with bcash uh, they gave away that responsibility where are they now like what two years I, I mean, it's a joke right it's a joke and as i said we it's it's not in the code uh, and this is very much a, a social phenomenon. And it is of sovereign individual nodes uh, that are, are monarchs in the kingdom of self, but, but anarchists in a network of peers. Uh, and it's, it's quite beautiful how this all plays out because uh, it, it is rather novel, right? Usually uh, social scalability ends at what, roughly 150 peers, right? Yeah. Um, but because we have software, because we have uh, the scalable way uh, of doing this with technology, with computation, uh, we can do better. Uh, and we are doing better, uh, but it's still fucking difficult. Uh, and when when we don't uh, watch what we're doing, right? And and when we when we stop building tools, and when we get uh, lazy and and compli uh, complicit, uh, then we are going to lose what we treasure most. And when when we when we will realize the mistakes that we've made, it will be too late. Uh, and Bitcoin might be the only chance that we fucking have. It is. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so you know, Bitcoin's our last shot to uh, to get uh, uh, well, not for humanity. All right, uh, I I won't have the the hubris to say that, but I mean, realistically, um, Bitcoin is our is our last best chance um, in our generation, possibly in my lifetime, um, to right the wrongs uh, on on many levels, um, whether they be uh, the absolute like travesty of the last century, uh, which is uh, the establishment of the fiat monetary system, whether it is um, uh, the creeping censorship that we're seeing um, arise uh, from the social justice warrior side or from any side whatsoever um, in the U.S. that's becoming a mainstream discourse. I mean, censorship is fashionable. Censorship is cool. You know, how the fuck did we get here? I mean, this is nuts. I mean, um, 1994, 1984 wasn't supposed to be an instruction manual, right? Um, and uh, it is, it, it is now. Um, so um, if Bitcoin fails, like uh, all the other shit coins are going to fail. Um, gold has already failed because gold is now owned by um, a very, very, very tiny minority of financial institutions. Um, what else is there? I mean, uh, how are we going to exit? I mean, um, if the, if the, if the boat sinks without a life raft, like, I mean, I don't want to say we're all going to drown, but I mean, when, this is not going to be fun. And, and, um, uh, we have, we have a real opportunity here and, uh, it's, it's not, it's not a game. It's not a joke. It's, it's, uh, it's not theoretical. Um, it's not, uh, just a hobby. I mean, this is, this is the soul, I, the way that I see it. I mean, I, we're kind of fighting for, for the, there's there's something we're fighting for here which is like almost a uh, uh, I don't know if we're fighting for our souls I don't know what we're fighting for specifically but I mean I definitely feel like there's something really really huge that we're doing here and um, you know if you think really long term you know imagine yourself in 60 years looking back at now and uh, you know 
you know, imagine yourself an old man, an old lady, uh, full of regrets and uh, watching the opportunity that we had to change something really and, you know, fucking it up because uh, we wanted like mass adoption right now to dump our bags on someone else. You know, that's not, that's not the approach we should be having. Um, we should be thinking about, um, you know, how our children, grand, grandchildren are going are gonna, to uh, see, see us. Um, look, look, at how, look at how a lot of the young people like me conceive the boomers. Right. Um, you know, I like my parents, but I don't like the boomer generation at all. I mean, they, they fuck me, you know, they put me on the hook to pay for their retirement and I get all my money devalued and I have to chase, you know, a fucking paycheck every week in order to keep up with inflation. And not only that, I have to pay taxes and not only that, you know, I'm paying at my pension, which is I'm never going to get, which is the Ponzi and they're, you know, you know, this is, this isn't, you know, we don't have a really good, uh, uh, we, we don't, we don't have a nice legacy here, right? Um, so think about the legacy that we want to give and, and think about that. And the, the thing I'm going to end on here is like, I've been thinking about, about users and Bitcoin users, like what's a Bitcoin user? And ultimately the way that I see it is you're either a Bitcoin user or you're a speculator, right? And if, you're a, if you don't run a full node, uh, you own Bitcoin, right? But you're not using Bitcoin. You just own Bitcoin. And why would you own Bitcoin if you're not using Bitcoin? It's just to get exposure to uh, to the price, which is okay. I mean, fair enough if that's what you're into. Um, but if you actually want to use Bitcoin, if you want to exercise your purchasing power, so purchasing power is not just a, a number, you know, purchasing power is only real if you can exercise it and you can only exercise it if it's not censored and if you're not afraid to exercise it, right? So if we really want the purchasing power of, of, of the money to stay stable and remain over time and not get devalued. It must be able to be exercised. It is completely meaning. Bitcoin is meaningless if you cannot use it or transact it. And they will stop. They will try to stop us from transacting it. Um, so if you own, if you don't own your keys and you don't run your node, you're nothing. <laughs> if you own your keys, uh, you're, you're an owner of Bitcoin, but you're not a new user. So become, become a real user of Bitcoin and run your node, own your keys. And, you know, take your own destiny in your own hands. And, you know, what's the cost? A little bit of time. Uh, so, you know, if it's not worth it to you, um, you know, what is? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, great words to end it on. Um, yeah. And it's, right, it's, it's this decrease of time preference. It's, as we've said several times, so several generations, right? We're, we're not doing this for us. Um, well, of course we are. Mm -hmm. But the main priority uh, is for our children's children and the legacy we'll leave behind. And uh, we have a tremendous opportunity to fuck them so utterly uh, and destroy their entire, well, of course, life and planet and, and universe. Uh, and we can do that. Like humans are pretty good at that. Uh, and we can be quite horrible creatures. Um, but that's not human nature. Uh, and I do believe that we have always the, the choice of, of acting what we know to be truthful. And that is always the right decision to make. And you know, you deeply, deeply know and understand uh, that stealing from others and murdering others is always, 100% of the time, all the time, unacceptable and despicable. Um, but if you do not act or if you do not align your actions according to this moral compass, mm -hmm then you do not understand the truth. And that is a very dangerous place to be in. Um, so yes, invest your time and attention to discover truth, which is not easy. Of course, that is the entire point. Um, and then make sure that you align your actions to, according to that which you know to be truthful. And when you do that consistently, you're going to end up in a place where, for example, Francis is now. Right? with a fucking stellar reputation, uh, with, with some awesome tools that he has built, with hundreds, thousands of people that he has helped and, and saved, literally, uh, with, with every person that you've onboarded, with, with every tool that you've developed, with every uh, customer that you've, you've satisfied. Uh, you saved them, and not just them, but their children's children. Mm -hmm. And that is such a, such a profound and, and everlasting positive karmic debt. Um, that 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 you've accumulated for yourself, and and that is something that will pay off not just for you and not just for your, your for your family, but for all of us. Uh, and I, I think that is that is the main, yeah, the, the main point why Bitcoiners are so motivated Be because we know this is not just for us. This is not just for our tribe. This is for everyone. This is for humans, uh, and uh, and we have tremendous hope uh, because we have tremendous potential. Because we have seen the last 150 years how we can fuck it up greatly. But realizing that we have fucked up means that we have the power to change. 
and and that gives me hope personally um and that's a, a lot of that uh, and having these tools at our disposals today now already uh, is beautiful because we can leave the first realm. We can leave force and violence and aggression behind and we can fully immerse ourselves in the second realm of peaceful anarchy. Uh, and with Bitcoin now, this is possible uh, much, much more than it was at probably any point in time. Uh, and if we don't, well, we deserve the hell that we are manifesting on, on uh, our planet. Uh, and if you do not want to see that hell being manifested, then fucking do something about it because no one else will. Um, so yes, use Bitcoin. Uh, don't buy it. Like, don't speculate on it. That's fucking boring. Uh, and foreign exchange in itself, and I think you agree with me, is evil in, uh, to the core. Um, so don't be one who, who buys low to sell the high or to buy the Lambo high then, but uh, be someone who builds tools uh, now in the bear market, uh, which is fucking lovely. I hope it continues. <laughs> um, so that then for the future, we have the opportunity uh, to make this world just a little bit more delightful, uh, which, which is a, a quite phenomenal goal. Uh, so Francis, yeah, I'm, I'm fucking proud to stand shoulder on shoulder with you uh, and, and to fight this battle for, for human freedom. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's an honor to, uh, to know that you have my back and, and that, that I will have yours. And that is something that is very powerful. And, and the relationships that we build now, we will, uh, we will continue to draw from for, uh, for a long, long time. So it's been an honor. Uh, and hell yeah. Uh, and let's make that fucking happen. Uh, let's do it. So, okay, last, last uh, chance to chill. Where can people find you and where can they experience the awesome service that you provide for your customers? Uh, you can, uh, I'm going to show my Twitter account, Francis Pouliot underscore. Uh, my website is bullbitcoin.com. And if you want to contribute to Cyphernode, it's cyphernode.io. And if you're looking to learn to develop Bitcoin, if you're a company that's looking to, um, you know, send us some interns, uh, we're definitely willing and able to uh, train some developers to become Bitcoin developers. We're, we're willing to spend some time, uh, uh, you know, onboarding some people. Um, if you were looking to build your, your resume in the Bitcoin space, working on Cypherinode is going to greatly increase your market value as a developer. Um, if you can put on your resume that you can deploy a blockchain type stamping app, a Bitcoin processing system, a full node, uh, if you can deploy a Lightning Network node, um, uh, as a developer, you will most likely um, find it much more easy to find a job. So definitely reach out to us and uh, we'll help you get in there. Um, that's pretty much it. Cyphernode.io, uh, bullbitcoin.com, and Twitter, Francis Bullet underscore. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, well, yeah, thank you, uh, Francis, for joining me. And Pierce, thank you for listening. See you on the next show. Bye-bye. <laughs>